Before we jump in, um, I wanted to cover something just quickly, and we're just going to I want you to see this. It's not in your notes. It's just on the screen. The sheet that you have that's extra goes into this in detail. And then there's a little addendum at the end of your notes tonight that goes into it in even more detail. But just for frame of reference, we're going to need this tonight. It was a question that came up last week after our session is what are the different Offerings As we were going through Leviticus 16, looking at the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, we were looking at these, the sacrifices that were offered. And Leviticus talks about, in chapters 1 through 5, it talks about uh, five different uh, sacrifices, the major sacrifices and offerings that were to be offered. And they're described, well, three of them that we really will be focusing on when we're thinking about atonement are these three right here, the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings and the description for each of those. So you can just see on the screen, just for a quick reference, Leviticus 1 talks about the burnt offerings and, and just kind of their purpose, just really talking about reconciliation, peace with God. As they are burned, there is, they talk about a pleasing aroma that would, that would be before the Lord as these sacrifices were offered. That's the burnt offerings. The sin offerings, uh, we're going to talk a lot about those tonight. Those are in Leviticus chapter 4. They have to do with cleansing, cleansing from sin, cleansing the person, cleansing the place where the people would gather to come into God's presence. And then you have the guilt offerings. And these guilt offerings that are talked about in Leviticus 5, they are really looking looking at when wrongs have been done, whether it's intentional or unintentional wrongs. It is this idea of a payment for wrongs. So if you have wronged your brother, uh, or you've done something, you would go and offer a guilt offering. And so those are three primary offerings. You're going to see those come up throughout our, our text tonight. You've got a chart in case you want to do a deeper dive into those. But just keep those in the back of your mind this evening as we, as we go through. So I wanted you to see that. The first thing I think it would be good for us to do, we watched a video last week. Did you guys enjoy the video of Leviticus? Uh, entertaining to see the, the drawings and the illustration there. I want you to watch one tonight that looks at this, this big concept of sacrifice and atonement that is going on in the narrative of Scripture. And so I think this will be helpful to frame our conversation as we, as we go through this evening. So we're going to watch that, and then we'll jump in. We all long for the world to be good, for people to live in peace, act with love and justice. But there's a problem. Something compels us humans to constantly wreak havoc and destruction instead, and we call this evil. And from the Bible's point of view, evil ruins things in at least two ways. There's a direct effect of our evil, like when someone steals from another person, they've created injustice. Hmm. Now, therefore, you know, they owe something to make it right. But there's another indirect effect of evil, because they've also ruined the environment of the relationship, creating a lack of trust, there's emotional damage. It's like vandalism, and they need to make that right, too. Now, many people believe, hey, God is good. He should be the one to just get rid of all the evil in the world. But let's be honest. I mean, the evil that I see everywhere out there, it's the same evil that's inside of me. We have all contributed, and, and we keep doing it. And so this kind of puts us in a bind. If God's going to rid the world of evil, he'll have to get rid of us. And this is what's so remarkable about the story of the Bible. This God is so good that not only is he going to rid the world of evil, he's going to do it without destroying humanity. So how is he going to do that? Well, early in the story of the Bible, we're introduced to this practice of animal sacrifice, which I know, it seems weird to us, but for the Israelites, it was a very powerful symbol of God's justice and of his grace. So remember, I'm a contributor to the evil that's in the world. I should be removed. But God is allowing this animal's life to be a substitute. It's symbolically dying in my place. And the biblical word for this is atonement, which means to cover over someone's death. But there's a second part to this ritual. Remember, evil also causes this relational vandalism. And in the Bible, this idea is described as polluting or defiling the land and making it unclean. 
So the priest would symbolically wash away the vandalism by sprinkling the animal's blood in different parts of the temple. So the animal's blood is cleaning things? Well, remember, this is a symbol, and it's a symbol that we're not used to. The blood represents life. And the sprinkling of the blood is this representation of how God is cleaning away these indirect consequences of evil in their community. In the Bible, this process is called purification. And so the temple and the land now become a clean space where God and his people can live together in peace. So this ritual makes things right between Israel and God. And more than that, the Israelites experience God's love and his grace through these symbols. And by being forgiven, ideally, this would compel them to become people of love and grace too. Right, that's the ideal, but it wasn't always happening. Right. So the prophet Isaiah, for example, he talks a lot about this. He opens his book by saying that the continual sacrifices of the Israelites had become meaningless because they were also allowing great evil in their midst, ignoring the poor and the oppressed. Even the Israelite kings were distorting justice. (laughs) But Isaiah looked forward to a day when a new king from the line of David would come and deal with evil, but in a surprising way. The king would become a servant and not just serve, but also suffer and die for the evil committed by his own people. And his life would be offered as a sacrifice. And this is the promise Jesus believed he was fulfilling. He's the king of Israel suffering and dying on the cross. In fact, Jesus himself used Isaiah's words when he said that he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that word ransom refers to a sacrifice of atonement. And so all over the New Testament, we hear about how Jesus' death was an atoning sacrifice for us. It covered the debt that humans owe God for contributing to all of the evil and death in his world. But the New Testament authors also talk about Jesus' death as providing purification. And so we hear about Jesus' blood as a symbol of his life, having this ability to wash away the vandalism that evil has caused in us and around us so we can now live at peace with God. So that's the meaning behind Jesus' death. But there's more to the story. Yeah, the New Testament makes this powerful claim that Jesus' death was not final. He rose from the dead. And so he's the sacrifice who broke the power of death and evil, which means that he lives on to offer his life to anyone who will accept it. He is the perfect sacrifice to which all the previous sacrifices were pointing all along. So because of Jesus, the early Christians stopped participating in the ritual of animal sacrifice. But they were given new rituals. There are two that Jesus taught his followers to perform. The first is called baptism. Just as Jesus died, so going into the water becomes this personal connection you now have to his death. And in coming out of the water, you, so to speak, come back to life with Jesus. So baptism is the sacred ritual that joins your story to Jesus' death and his resurrection. The second ritual is called the Lord's Supper, which is a reenactment of Jesus' last meal with his disciples, and he used bread and wine to portray his coming death as a sacrifice. And so now, followers of Jesus, they take the bread and the cup regularly to remember and to participate in the power of Jesus' death and in his life. So these rituals, they remind us of God's love and encourage us to live a life of love and grace. But they do more than that. They connect us to a new life source. The very power that brought Jesus back from the dead, it's the same power that can deal with the evil in our own lives and transform us into people who lead lives of love and peace. All right. Helpful? Just to see it put together like that? Mike liked it back there. That's good. Yeah, I thought it was helpful just to see it. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of points there that are, we're going to bring out as we go along so we don't have to sit and dissect the video uh, right now because we're going to talk about some of it. But it made some really good points that I think help us understand what Jesus is doing when we think about his sacrifice being an atonement for the atonement for us. So we'll see that more as we go along. Remember last week, we set the stage as we, as we began talking about atonement. We said, you could really say the Old Testament, the theme of the Old Testament is even found here in Genesis chapter two, 22, where Isaac asks Abraham, where is the lamb? 
for the sacrifice? Where is the lamb that we can offer that will make peace with God, us, between us as sinful human beings and, and God as the holy creator uh, and author of all things? Like, where is that sacrifice? And the whole Old Testament is asking that question. And we began unpacking that as we even thought through the, the Day of Atonement and, and all the times that the people of Israel, God's chosen people, were commanded uh, in covenant relationship with him to come before him year after year and time after time, constantly offering these sacrifices. They were always asking that question. That is the theme of the Old Testament. But for our conversation tonight, because we're jumping on to the New Testament, so when we think about how atonement is revealed in the grandest way in the person and work of Jesus, we could rightly look at the New Testament and say, well, the theme of the New Testament, we can see when Jesus walks upon John the Baptist along the Jordan River. And what does John the Baptist say when he sees Jesus? Behold the lamb, right? The whole Old Testament is asking the question, where is the lamb? The New Testament answers that question when the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we behold the lamb. And what does he say about him? Who takes away the sin of the world. And so we see this. The New Testament is going to just do this grand reveal of Jesus and what it is he came to do and why it is so important for us to be in a new covenant relationship with God. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight as we move on. There's some words you need to be aware of. They won't be on any kind of quiz. You don't have to know the Greek words, but these are important words that we're going to see as we, as we go along. So here's the three words, hilasmas, hilasterion, and hilaskamai. All right, so these words are the words in Greek that are used in the New Testament to talk about atonement. And you have those there in your note with the definition, what they mean. But let's just look for a minute at each one and see some passages of Scripture that actually use these words. So the first word there, um, helasmas, meaning atoning sacrifice or propitiation. First John chapter two and in chapter four, look at this. It says, he is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not just for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Chapter four, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. How did he display? How did he communicate that love? By sending his son to do what? To be that propitiation, to be that atoning sacrifice for you and I. Let's look at the next word, hilasterion. This is the word that really correlates, corresponds to the Hebrew word we saw last week that talked about the mercy seat. This also deals with propitiation. This is a atonement covering, a sacrifice of atonement. Look at in Hebrews 9, we'll come back to this one in a little while when it talks about the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies, it uses that word. Above it were the cherubim of gold overshadowing the hilasterion, the mercy seat, this place where God's wrath is satisfied and sin is atoned for. Romans chapter three uses it as well when it says, God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance. He has passed over former sins, but God was never going to just excuse sin. His holiness would not allow him to just turn a blind eye to sin and allow it to go unpaid for. But instead, as we've seen week after week so far, he, that sin is paid for in the death of his son. The verb that I want you to see here, this idea to make propitiation, to appease, helaskamai, right? In Luke chapter 18, when the tax collector, when, when Jesus shows two, two men who go to pray, you've got the Pharisee who goes in to pray and he talks about how he is so thankful he's not like the tax collector because he does all these righteous things and that is what puts him in right standing before God. But what does the tax collector do? 
It says, he standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is that word. God, make propitiation, atone for my sin because he knows he cannot do it. That's a powerful statement when you read that passage that's familiar, but you think of it in light of atonement and what this tax collector is really saying. God, would you, would you be appeased? Would you make atonement for my sin? And then Hebrews chapter two, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So just a quick little high level view of looking at these words and how they're used. Uh, but they all point to Jesus. Every one of those, right? They point to him. And so in Jesus, we see this. He is the priest who performs the sacrifice. He's the one who is the sacrifice in and of himself. And he is the place. He is the mercy seat where the blood is, is poured out in order to cleanse us of sin. It is all wrapped up in him. The work is finished in, in what he did for us. And so powerful, powerful thing we're gonna see as we look through Hebrews tonight, but that's just an overview for us as we, as we start moving on. So we've got to get going or we'll never get through these chapters in Hebrews. So the rest of our time tonight, is gonna be spent in Hebrew. So if you've got your Bible, open it up or open up an app on your phone so that, or use your notes in your book. Um, definitely have your notebook open and have your notes out because there may be words here you wanna circle. Maybe go back later and circle them in your Bible if you like to take notes in the margin. But I want us to walk through some passages. We're gonna start in Hebrews chapter eight. Just, uh, I want us to go through this quickly. And I want to point out some things that I think are really important for us to see uh, to frame our conversation here. So Hebrews chapter 8. Now the point in what we are saying, talking about Jesus being the high priest here of a better covenant, the point in what we are saying, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Circle that word seated. The word seated. You're going to see it come up again later in Hebrews, but this idea is this idea of it is completed. The work is done. What Jesus did on the cross through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, the work is completed for our sin to be atoned. He is the high priest and he sat down. When the priest was serving in the temple, he never sat down. Why? What was that communicating when the people saw the priest never sitting down? What was that a reminder of for them? That the work was never done. The work of, of atoning for sin was never done under the old covenant. But Jesus, in his work, he sat down at the right hand of the Father when he completed the work that truly atones for sin. So think about that picture real quick, right? So the, in, the, in the two parts of the temple, you have the, the what's called uh, just the temple or the holy place. That's, that's where the, uh, the menorah with the lighting, that's where the showbread and that's where the incense would be. Um, and a priest would go in there. They were on shifts uh, morning and evening. They would, they would go in there, and they maintained that entire area. Uh, and then remember, in the back portion, uh, the Holy of Holies, a high priest would only go in there once a year, right? Imagine what it would signal if a priest went in there and just sat down. Wouldn't that be really out of place? Right? Because they're only going in there. They're quickly doing their work. They're trying to do everything just right because God is holy. And then they get out of there. Right? It's a, it's a completely foreign idea to think through that priest going into that holy space and sitting down. What? Why are you 
sitting down. See how foreign that is? Yeah, it's good. And then, and then he moves on and he talks about how what Christ is doing is the true thing. It is the real thing that all of the old covenant is just a shadow, right, of the real thing. And so you see that there. Look, it says that um, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, verse 2, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Then it jumps back and it talks about in the, under the old covenant with uh, the Mosaic law, every high priest under that covenant is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it's necessary for this priest also to have something to offer, right? But then look at verse five. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So, so the author of Hebrews is wanting us to see there's a connection here. There's a picture we're supposed to see in the old covenant, but everything in it points to something greater and something better, and that is Jesus. And that's going to be really important as we continue to look tonight. There, are, See, the, in the next verse there, it says, see, they make everything according to the pattern that was shown. But as it is, Christ, verse 6, has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old. Because as the covenant he mediates, it is better since it is enacted on better promises. So what's being referenced there is uh, on Mount Sinai when, when Moses went up to get the instructions to build the tabernacle with God and the covenant. Um, that apparently Moses was allowed to see the heavenly temple and then was instructed to make the earthly tabernacle like that one. Make replica, right? That's, that's, that's what we're being instructed here. So it's, it's talking about, hey, Moses got to see the real deal and then, and then made a replica with the earthly tabernacle and then later temple. That's good. But then look at verse seven. This is important. For if that first covenant, right? That's what Jason's talking about. When Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, God initiates the first covenant with his people, Israel, right? It is it, the language of that. It's like a marriage. God is saying, I will take you to be my people. I will marry you. And we will enter into a covenant relationship together where I will do this. I will be your God and I will provide for you and I will protect you and I will bless you. And he says, if you will obey me. If you will put me first, if you will have no other gods before me, right? And so God lays out the terms of the first covenant, but look what the author of Hebrews says about that first covenant. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Was the fault with God or was the fault with Israel? Yeah, very good. The fault was with Israel. And look at what it says, verse eight, he finds fault with them when he says, and he goes on and gives this, this, this quote here from the Old Testament, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This was with Moses on Mount Sinai. Why? For they did not continue in my covenant. If you were to get into the prophets in the Old Testament and you, were, and you read like some of the messages that God has for Israel after they have turned away from him repeatedly, chasing after idols, offering sacrifices to foreign gods, not obeying the covenant law that God had given them, God tells them, I am going to divorce you. Like I am gonna hand you a bill of divorce because you have broken the covenant that I established with you, right? That is, that, is, that is harsh and it is meant, you're meant to feel the harshness of that. But then God turns around and gives a promise on the heels of that and he says, but for this is the covenant that I made with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each other one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they will know me 
from the least of them to the greatest. It's this new covenant that's being referenced. God's saying, I will bring you back. My covenant people will be those whose law, my law was written on their hearts, right? Not on tablets of stone, but on their hearts. Those will be my covenant people. And he says, I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. How would he do that in the new covenant? Through Christ, through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, he would show mercy and he would sacrifice himself for so that he could remember their sins no more. So important for us to just to see that, just to understand what God is doing in the work of Jesus and how it just is this better picture of what this, these shadows that we have in the Old Testament. So setting up where we're headed in Hebrews 9 and 10. But before we go there, we need to review last week and what we saw in Leviticus 16. So, so remember last week we covered uh, the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. And getting that imagery fresh in your mind will uh, make Hebrews chapter 9 pop. Okay, because there's going to be a lot of references to it and what goes on in heaven. Uh, but we need to quickly be reminded of what needed to take place on the Day of Atonement. So remember, uh, the Day of Atonement is going to be led and conducted by the high priest. Uh, in Leviticus 16, it's Aaron himself. His sons had just died uh, for doing unworthy sacrifices. Uh, but Aaron is prescribed to put on his special holy clothes, right? He's supposed to dress in a particular way. He's got to go through all ritual washings to put those clothes on. He puts on his priestly garments. And what is the first sacrifice that is made? His behalf. Yeah, what is it? It's a bull. Okay? So a bull is sacrificed on the altar. If uh, The altar is outside the temple, okay? The temple is broken up into two portions, but the altar is on the outside. So the, the bull is sacrificed and laid on the altar. The altar is fire, okay? Uh, but the blood is captured in a bowl. Now he is supposed to go into the temple, past the holy place, and back into the Holy of Holies. He's supposed to be carrying this blood of, of the bull, but also he is to take a fire pan full of ashes from uh, the altar and sacrifice. <clears throat> and he's supposed to take that back there <clears throat> and allow those ashes to be incense that fill the entire area with smoke, right? He's not supposed to look at the Lord. That whole area is supposed to be filled with smoke. And then he's supposed to take his uh, the blood, I'm supposed to sprinkle it on the mercy seat and seven times to dip and place it on the mercy seat. Remember, what is the mercy seat? It is the Ark of the Covenant, but also what else? When you think of the mercy seat, what is it? It is God's throne, right? It is his footstool here on earth. It is the throne of God. Okay, so... The first sacrifice is made for who, what? For the priest himself, just to be back there, okay? Just to be able to, to do this, okay? Then next, he, he comes back out. All of that is done. Sacrifice has been made for him. Then what does he take next? A goat, right? There, remember, there's two goats. That are, there's a bull and two goats. Now we're going to take the first goat. Lots are cast to determine which goat. And now he's going to, again, sacrifice, collect the blood, okay? And now he goes in and does the same uh, blood sprinkling and seven times on the altar. But this time, who or what is the sacrifice for? Not exactly. To the yes, okay. To purify the tabernacle itself, okay? To purify and to cleanse the... Because of the sins of the people and the tabernacle is amongst the people, the tabernacle itself needs to be cleansed. 
okay, including, including the, uh, the instruments that are, in the, uh, that are in the holy place, not just the mercy seat. So yes, uh, the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies, but also everything else, including even the altar that is outside. The blood needs to be applied to the altar, okay? So all of that is for cleansing the temple itself, okay? The tabernacle itself and all the instruments. And then the third movement is now what? Yeah, it's, it's the goat that remains, Okay, and this one's alive. And what does the high priest do? Well, right there, right there in the temple, he lays his hands and he declares all the sins of the people upon that goat. Okay, and at that moment, all the sins, right, in God's God's the one who set this up, right? In that, in God's economy, all of those sins are being placed upon that goat. The people begin to, as the goat is now led out, of, out into the wilderness, the people curse and spit at the goat, right? Hiss at it. But that goat is ushered outside the camp into the wilderness. Why? Because he has become the people's sin. And then, then you're done. Praise the Lord. The Lord has forgiven us. Our sins have been atoned for. With all of that in mind, now it, it will help us to read Hebrews chapter 9. Excellent. So let's jump in. We're just going to work our way through this with the time we have remaining. So um, it's just good, good old-fashioned Bible study here as we go through. But we'll pause along the way and just see some of this language um, it may be me, Jason may jump in, I may jump back in, it's, we'll just hear how this goes as it goes, okay? So <laughs> let's just jump in and do it. Very well planned. Yes, it is. It's so scripted. Now, verse one, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. Now, when I'm thinking about even just this first verse here, right, it goes back to what we said last week. Like, we, even in the new covenant, we cannot just approach God any way that we want to, right? And that's kind of a popular thought, and that's kind of thrown out in, in culture today. It's like, well, God doesn't care that much about sin, right? It's, you can just come to him any way you want. You know, there are God views that diminish the holiness of God. It's not being diminished in the new covenant, right? There are still, <laughs> there is a way we come to him. And what is that way? How do we come to God? Through who? Through Jesus, right? He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, right? Those, those regulations, those standards are still very much in place of we must approach God a certain way. It's, it's what we call... Uh uh, progressive revelation. There's a reason that uh, the old covenant came before the new covenant. Okay? There's a reason God didn't immediately jump to the new covenant. He wanted you to learn something, right? And that was this. And this is what the author of Hebrews is telling us. Okay? Look at worship in the old covenant. Yes, you're going to understand that Jesus fulfilled, but understand what he fulfilled because it matters. And so then he goes on to describe these regulations for worship uh, in this earthly place. And what does it remind you of in verses two through five? There's a tent, there's a there's sectioned off, there's a first section with a lampstand and a table and the bread of the presence, it's the holy place. Then there's a curtain with another section that's called the most holy place with an altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. What is he describing here? 
Yeah, the tabernacle, for sure. And, it's, and so this is that picture we were seeing in Leviticus chapter 16. So he's talking about that very thing, these, this thing that would be the picture in their mind to understand a spiritual truth that they needed to know um, as they thought about worshiping God. And, so, and he even gives some more detail about what's inside the ark. As, uh, we're not going to have time to get into that and what those things symbolize tonight. But, but he's, talk, he's giving that detail. Um, it, and look at what he says in verse five. Above it were the cherubim of glory. We read this verse a minute ago of overshadowing the what? And what does the mercy seat represent? The, the throne of God. And it is the place where the blood would have been poured out sprinkled upon the altar there, making atonement for sin. Now look, verse six, these preparations having thus been made, the priests go where? Regularly into where? The first section, performing their ritual duties daily, night and day. They're performing duties that are prescribed in the Mosaic law. In the book of Leviticus, we see these things laid out Look at verse 7, but into the second place, what is that second place? The holy of holies, right? How often do they go? And who can go? And he can't go without what? Is that important? That he can't go without blood. That's significant, isn't it? It was significant in the old covenant, what would happen if the high priest went in without the blood? Yeah, he'd be, he'd be coming out by the rope uh, because that bell around his ankle would stop, uh, stop dinging. <laughs> right, if he came in that way. So look at what was necessary there. He must go in. The high priest is the only one who could go in to the holy place. And when he went in, he had to bring the blood. Who did he offer it for? For himself and says the unintentional sins of the people. Then he talks about it. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. Look at this next section here. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifice are offered. What's going on in the old covenant? What does it say about them? They cannot what? What can these sacrifices that were being offered night and day, then on the day of Yom Kippur when the high priest would go in once a year, what does it say right there uh, at the end of verse 9 about those sacrifices? They cannot what? They cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. They cannot make you clean. They deal only with temporary things, with food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until the time of the Reformation. So we're setting this up. There is this picture that goes on year after year and day after day, and it is just that. It is a picture because it never truly deals finally and ultimately with sin. But let's look on. You want to take over for a minute and pick up in verse 11? Yeah, accept my apologies because my version is different from yours. Oh, that's right. I put the ESV in here, so I should have switched. All right, but then, but then in verse 11, Christ is introduced. But when Christ appeared as a what? What is he? He's the high priest. Okay? He entered into where? Yeah, which is what, which is what tabernacle? Well, it's the heavenly tabernacle, right? That's, now we're getting a, a picture into the heavenly scene. That Christ didn't enter into the earthly tabernacle, but rather into the heavenly tabernacle, okay? A tabernacle not made with hands. And when he went in, verse 12, did he go in with the same blood of, of, of bulls and goats? Okay, so think about that. Think about what that's saying and think of why it references. Why, does it, why do you think he says bulls and goats? Because that, that's what happened on Yom Kippur. Okay, so you see he's referencing that. That's why he says blood of bulls and goats. Okay, but now Christ is going in with his own blood. 
Then look at verse 13. He's going to make a statement about that. For if the blood of bulls, uh, of goats and bulls, and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those, uh, sprinkling on those who had been defiled, if that had sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, then how much more would the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works for the living God? So the first thing is, is He says, "Look, we know that these don't permanently work." But if it worked for a short period of time, even though it was temporary and it had to happen over and over and over again in the temple because, because God required it, if it worked on like this, this short-term basis, how much more would Christ's blood in the heavenly tabernacle actually cleanse your conscience, okay? Actually change you from the inside, this new covenant. That's where he's going with that. So good. So look on then, look at verse 15. We kind of switch gears a little bit, but he says, therefore he, who is the he? Right, good. He is the mediator. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance. Since a death has occurred, what does that death do? It redeems those from the transgressions committed even under the first covenant. Right, so Christ's death is accomplishing that. His is the death that has occurred. He says for, now here's this transaction where a will is involved, right? This statement, right, of what's supposed to happen after a death. What, when a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established in order for it to take effect. That's what verse 17 says. For a will only takes effect at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. And so in Christ's death, we see this new covenant enacted. His death initiates this new covenant. It says, even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood, but how much more the new covenant, the covenant that Jesus has made with his blood is inaugurated with the shedding of his blood. Then in verse 19, he's, yeah. he's just going to talk about the fact that uh, on Mount Sinai, at the, at the first covenant, when the people accepted the covenant, uh, Moses took the blood of bulls and goats, but he, he took hyssop, uh, hyssop branch, and he sprinkled it on the people. That's what he's talking about. This, this is how the people received the first covenant, was like this. Through the, through the sprinkling of blood upon the people, they stood at the base of the mountain, and Moses did all that. Okay. So now how much more those of us uh, enacting this new covenant? Yeah, in the same way he sprinkled it with the blood, right? Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Look at this phrase, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Have you heard that before? Does that pop up in other things that we've read already? When a phrase is repeated, when, it, if, when a phrase is used in scripture, is it important even if it's used one time? Oh, you better believe it because all scripture is breathed out by God. It is inspired by him. If it's in there, it's in there for a reason. It is inspired by him. But now when something is in there repeatedly, when you see phrases like this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. When a New Testament writer goes back and pulls an Old Testament passage and he quotes it, do you think there's something God really wants us to know? Is there a message he really wants us to see? Absolutely. That's why it's in here. That's why we see it again here. He wants us to understand. Why would it be so important for us to understand without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin? Why is that a point God is driving home? Okay, it points to the fact that no one else could do it, but Jesus, he alone can forgive sin through his blood. Yes, 100%, yes. Is there anything else that we can take away when we understand this phrase and we really meditate on it? Reminds us of, of, of God's holiness. And what we, what we would, just to fill out that picture, that there's always cost to forgiveness. There's always cost 
to forgiveness. Don't forget that. Your sin was paid for. It wasn't magically wiped away and like God forgot it. That's not the way forgiveness works. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is always cost. That is why Christ is the only way. Yeah. And then there's this rich truth that is so good for us to understand that we pick up here in this this last section on page 36. I want to skip down. And I want you to start... um, Let's pick up in verse 24. It says, Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things. We've talked about that. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He is the mediator of this covenant. He has appeared before God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, like the high priest of the old covenant had to do when they came in every year with blood not their own. For then he would have had... for if." he would have had to have suffered repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he, that is Jesus, has appeared how often? Not just once, once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Is that good news? That he did it once for all to put away sin, to deal with sin, the power of sin once and for all. That's the good news of the gospel. Amen? That's that's the good news when we think about the atonement, that Jesus' atonement is not an atonement that has to be made year after year. Jesus doesn't have to die repeatedly because somehow the blood lost its power and now we've got to do it again for another round until it loses its power. Yeah, so so go back to the picture of of chapter eight, right? And that is, so think of Yom Kippur. I told you how how silly silly it would be to ever think of a priest just going into the holy place and sitting down, right? There's there's showbread and incense. Like, what are you doing sitting down in there? Now think of on Yom Kippur, the high priest going back to the mercy seat into the Holy of Holies and sitting down. This is this once and for all. This is the picture. It's been cleansed, okay? Some of the parts we skipped over were were just that uh, his blood has been sprinkled inside the tabernacle to cleanse everything, all of that referring to Yom Kippur. And now he is seated next to the throne at the Father's right hand. You can't go in the Holy of Holies and just sit down. Well, yes, you can. <laughs> if you're the son. Right. Who sprinkled his blood. Who right. sprinkled his blood. Right. Right. That picture, remember even from the video, what was that picture like when the priest was sprinkling the blood? What did, what did, what did they say? What did the narrator say in the video? That was this picture of what was taking place. Remember the word that popped up and kind of filled the screen? Purification, good memory. Yeah, this cleansing, this purification. I mean, let's just get practical for just a minute. We're doing pretty good on time. Um, Do you ever have like thoughts creep into your mind where you wonder, like, could God really forgive me for that? Right, surely my standing before God like is in question because I mean, I know it says he died and he paid for my sin, but do you live with a, sometimes with this, this fear of like, but, but maybe that's not meant for me. Maybe it wasn't enough. Maybe there's something I need to do to earn that, that covering of my sin, that purification. Do you ever do that? I mean, am I alone in that, that there are just those moments where those those thoughts make you question? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of heads and like little, yeah, uh, yeah that's, a, that's a real thing. Guys, that's why the atonement is so powerful to know these truths. It is so powerful for us because it is the weapon, <laughs> one of the weapons we can use to combat the lies of the enemy that tell us we are not enough 
that, that there must be something more we need to do to earn the love and acceptance and forgiveness of God, that there must be more we must do because our status before God is in question, right? That's that lie of the enemy. How do we fight that lie? With the sword of the spirit, with the word of God, that weapon. And to understand the truth of the atonement is that weapon that we can use to say, wait a minute, I never was good enough, right? My heart was wicked, right? Sin had polluted my soul to my very core, right? But how am I right with God? The blood of Jesus was sprinkled (laughs) upon my heart and he has cleansed me. And if it's only once for all that he did that, then is my standing in jeopardy before a holy God if I have had the blood of Jesus applied to my life? No, it absolutely is not, right? There are so many Christians that go through life almost anemic because they are constantly battling (laughs) that idea of assurance and is God happy with me? Does God, right, or is he angry with me? And what do I need to do to appease an angry God. Well, the truth is you need to do nothing to appease an angry God because Jesus has done it for you. He has appeased the wrath of God for you. That's the beauty of the atonement. Well, and to even read the book of Hebrews in reverse and to go back to the earlier sections of scripture and to realize if you take this picture of Jesus as the fulfillment of Yom Kippur. He has gone into the heavenly temple. He is now seated at the right hand of Father and everything has been cleansed. And then you go to those passages of prayer where it says, come, Hmm. come. You you do not have a high priest who cannot uh, sympathize with your weaknesses. Come. That's good. He's been tempted as every, every way as you are, yet without sin. He understands. So the scene is in that heavenly throne room, but because everything has been cleansed and because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, you, dear one, get to enter yourself and bring your request before the King of kings and the Lord of lords because of the blood of Jesus, right? You know, obviously, you're not worthy to walk into that scene. But when you, when you see the fulfillment of God's space and then you realize we are ushered in, isn't that magnificent? And, and you don't question, can I pollute it? No, no, no. His, his, his blood is already covered. There, there's, a, there's a freedom there, right? To walk, um, you know, here in a, I don't know, Three weeks, two weeks from now, uh, you're going to see a baptism and you're going to hear a baptism testimony that says it in the most incredible way uh, because I got to watch it being filmed yesterday. Uh, And someone who understands and grasps this truth said it like this. I no longer have to work from a place for approval. Now I get to serve God from a place of having his approval. I'm not working for it. I am now serving God because I have it. Isn't that good? Amen. That's an understanding of the atonement and what it does for us. Uh, I mean, it gives me, it gives me chill bumps when I, when I think about that, because when we get that, it sets us free, right? It sets us free to just live for Christ because we know (laughs) our redemption has been purchased, right? We're not always worrying about, have I done enough? Because he's done it all. We just get to live now in gratitude because we have been accepted, because we have been cleansed. It's so powerful. Chapter 10 in Hebrews just goes on and it talks about some of these very things again that we have already been talking about tonight. So for sake of time, I want us just to kind of move on um, down, if that's okay with you. Um, You know, I love that verse 11 unpacks what we've already unpacked for you. Uh, every priest stands daily at his service in the old covenant, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never really take away sin. But when Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, right? That picture is just, <laughs> it's, it's the, the writer is telling us again, get this, understand this. 
He has completed it. The work of sacrifice has been done and it does not need to be done again. He has offered it and he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. It's beautiful. Then you get to verse um, 21. Let's, let's look at verses 21, um, 22. Because of all this, because of what Christ has done, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, what should we do? What does verse 22 say? Draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. How can we have a true heart in full assurance of faith? Our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's beautiful, isn't it? When you start to just connect all the dots and you see what God is doing in the work of Christ and how this Old Testament picture just comes to life. Uh, this thing that was just a shadow, just a, just a painting, and now you're seeing it three-dimensional in the work of Jesus. It's so good, so good. We got time, I think, to flip over to Hebrews 13 in your notebook there or, or in your Bible, whichever you prefer. Um, we're gonna close with this little section here at the end of Hebrews 13. I want to read it, and then we're going to talk about it for what time we have left. Verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Talking about the sin offering. That was what was done in the, with the sin offering. Verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Anything you want to jump in with before we? How are we going to unpack that? Yeah, we're going to unpack. Well, go ahead and start unpacking it if you want to. But I've been talking a lot. I want to give. So he makes it, he makes a distinction at the beginning, right? He says, for we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle, sorry, my version is slightly different, have no right to eat. What does that mean? He says, we have an altar that those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So the tabernacle, right, is, is the temple. And who would eat off the altar in the, the temple? Priest. The priests, right? It, it, was, it was part of their provision, okay? When, when you gave offering, part of the, the major portion of their provision, their salary, was eating the offerings, okay? So here he says, we have an altar that they can't eat. See that? This is, this is exclusive. Only to who? Who's the we? Yeah, it's born-again believers. It's all those who come in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? These are the only ones that can eat from, from this table because it's, it's exclusively of our high priest. Then he goes on. Uh, he said, For the bodies of the animals whose blood is brought to the holy place, right, in this sin offering, where are they taken? outside the camp, okay? Jesus himself was outside the camp. So he, he just made this distinction, okay, about Christians. And that is, hey, we have our own altar. And by the way, it's completely different from their altar. 
And guess what? This makes us different. So different, let me point your mind to the fact that the sin offering was outside the camp. No one wanted to be associated with that. That was, that was, right? Why would anyone be associated with that? But Jesus was outside the camp, guys. In other words, this Jesus is a complete opposite direction from the world. There are, there are things, now don't get discouraged, we have our own altar. We get to eat from his altar, from his table. It's good. It's completely different. But all of this is completely different. It's going to feel so foreign from the world, from a system where you can earn God's favor. All of this is going to feel complete, and the world's going to think you're pretty strange. Come outside the camp. Why? Why would you come outside the camp? That's where, <laughs> that's where our high priest is. He's just different. Come to him. It's going to look different. It's going to feel different. Come to him outside the camp. This, this is a call to swim upstream, to go in the opposite direction, to at times be misunderstood. It's not like we don't want to explain things, but you're going to be misunderstood. Because yeah. you're, you're not earning anything. Yeah, so you see like in the gospel, right, the curse of sin <laughs> is dealt with, right? The curse of the fall is reversed, right? In the, in, the, in the gospel, you know, we are redeemed, right? But that message is foolishness <laughs> to those who, who, who don't believe, right? So, you know, like those, people would see the cross and they would say, cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. And Jesus hung on the tree, and in being cursed for us, what did we receive from that? Blessing, forgiveness, redemption, right? So the curse is reversed, right? This idea, like, you know, even the scapegoat that was sent outside the camp on the day of Yom Kippur, right? It was cursed. Like they would spit at it as it would, as it would, as it would run away. They would spit at this goat. Why would they spit at it? Because it was symbolically carrying what? Their sin. And so they would spit at it. What happened to Jesus when he walked the Via Dolorosa out of the city to die on a cross outside the city walls? They spit on him, right? What happened with the sin offering? Where did they take it? Outside the city, right? So this picture is there, right? But like Jason said, right, we don't, we don't spit upon Jesus, right? Because we understand that in his sacrificial death, in his atonement, that is where we have life. Right? The curse that he bore by becoming the curse for us. Right now, we don't look at that right, as, as something awful. We look at it as it is the thing we would, we would run to him. We would draw near to him because that is where we find forgiveness. That is where we find life. And that's what the writer goes on to say in verse 13. Let's go to him. Why? I mean, he says, because here on this earth, this temporary life, we have no lasting city. You know, this is not our home as those who have been redeemed, but we do have a city that is to come, right? We have a hope. We have an assurance. And that's what he's saying. Let's run to him. Let's lift our heads and let's not get so burdened down by the cares of this world that we forget that we stand as those who have had their sins atoned by the blood of the lamb, that we have a great high priest who has offered his own blood so that we could be purified, so that we could be cleansed, so that our guilt could be removed. And I love how he ends. Verse 15, there, the, through him then, let us continually offer what kind of sacrifice? Yeah, so not bulls and goats, not a lamb slain on an altar. Why do we not have to offer that sacrifice? Because he's already offered it once and for all. What is the sacrifice now? Because we understand that we have been redeemed. Praise. 
thanksgiving, offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Guys, when I think about applying the atonement, like to, the, to my everyday life, like what, does, what should that do? Right, it should keep me in a constant state of just worship and praise to understand like my standing before a holy God and that you know, no matter what happens here, nothing changes that. My eternal home, my citizenship that is in heaven. But also to understand that by having the blood of Jesus sprinkled upon my heart, right, I bear his name. Right, my heart has been cleansed by his blood. I bear the name of Jesus. So if I'm really applying this truth that we've looked at for two weeks to my life, like I am thinking about Jesus, how do I glorify your name the best? Because I bear it, I bear your name. So what is it I need, I should do daily to acknowledge that, to acknowledge your name, to live in a way that is different in a way that points to him, that exalts him. Like that's a truth about the atonement that I can sink my teeth into in the way that I live my life, right? It's important. Thing you wanna? Yeah, we're out of time, but I, I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, just... I, hope, I hope this guy's, uh, I hope this lights a fire in your soul for theology and for the word of God and to, and to realize how magnificent God is. That, that his word was written 2,000 years before Christ came, that the covenant was made, that, that uh, uh, the covenant was enacted, that all of these things are put into place all of it in, in anticipation for the son coming. And, and then the fact that Jesus was crucified outside the camp and, and that we had the privilege of going to Israel and, and seeing the probable location of that crucifixion outside the camp and all of that. And, and to know and to understand, like, this is God revealing himself to us. Isn't it magnificent? All of these details and to say, yeah, all of it points to Christ. All of it points to Christ. The, the, the bull uh, for the high priest and the cleansing of the temple itself and, and the atoning of the sins and going outside the camp, all of that, all of that's Christ. He did it all. Um, it's, it's just magnificent. I hope it stirs up a, a fire in you for, uh, uh, for the richness of God's word and, and why he revealed himself this way. Amen. So with that, God bless you guys and have a great week, okay? See you next week. <laughs>